but uh, but exercise present quantum invariance of three manifolds and four manifolds. Please. Well, thank you very much for introduction and for um, having me here. So I'll try to make this uh, lectures uh, very informal. Uh, so I'm really hoping that you can interrupt me at any point. I didn't prepare slides intentionally. I'll use um, whiteboard and um, the way it's going to work is uh, I post uh, the link in chat. Oops, uh, so let me make sure that I uh, send it to everyone. Uh, here we go. Uh, so this is a link that I'll use for all of the three lectures, assuming things uh, work out smoothly. You can open it on your device and um, uh, follow um, independently uh, what I'm going to write on my iPad. So this way you can have your own control of, of the situation. So currently I'm sharing screen. I hope you can see it. Uh, it's basically the same whiteboard. So this is the white space where I'll be writing. On the left pane, you see options to zoom out or zoom in. This uh, compass looking button is a navigation, so you can move it around and I'll try to move it around as we proceed. And then um, there are various uh, buttons here. Uh, I guess I just took a photo. So, so, so again, can, can you share yeah. the file again? Uh, so yes, the yes. audience here uh, are not logged in yet. So if uh, we log, log in, we cannot see. No, but uh, will we not see it on the... Uh, he'll share the screen, right? Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll be sharing the screen, but uh, also it's true that um, I want everyone to, to have the link. So here it is again. I post it in uh, Zoom chat. Um, once, um, if I'm already like halfway into the lecture and um, uh, other people are logging in. I hope moderators or organizers can share the link or feel free to post it on the website. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll reshare the screen uh, one more time. So um, basically, uh, yeah, so you, this way you have control uh, over the link yourself and I'll, I'll share the screen. So I'll try to follow the, what, what I'm writing on, on iPad. Um, I should say that sometimes um, uh, the, the, this board needs to be refreshed. For example, if your iPad or computer goes to sleep, uh, then once you uh, open it up, uh, press this refresh button, this rotating circle, and uh, it should do the job. It will refresh the whiteboard. So uh, here is, for example, I already wrote something. This is uh, These are a couple of references. Uh, both are based on uh, joint work with Boris Fagan and one of the papers on three manifolds is with um, a group of other people. Uh, but the lectures will be very broad and uh, there'll be many uh, things that I'll borrow from uh, other works. And uh, that's why this is just um, a rough um, uh, basis for, for what uh, I'll use for, for this lectures. However, if you want some details or place where to follow up or uh, uh, learn more about certain things that I'll be saying, then this may be our two good places to, to start. So um, are there any logistical questions or uh, questions on how we're going to use the whiteboard, for example? OK. Feel free to interrupt me at any point. Like I said, I, I really wish to recreate as much as possible the experience of us uh, sitting in the room. And um, um, therefore, I really encourage you to stop me, ask questions, and uh, or make suggestions, actually. Right. So uh, in this first lecture, I'll try to tell you a little bit about what this subject uh, is all about. And uh, in lectures, uh, two and three, probably especially two, which is going to be the core part. There will be lots of definitions and theorems, so it will obviously become more um, 
technical, not not in the sense uh, abstract and hard to follow, but in the sense of it will be more structured. But I want to uh, start by giving you a big picture and uh, explaining uh, why we are doing this. So this is, uh, of course, a necessary element of any first lecture. So let me spend at least half an hour on uh, big picture. And uh, in other words, uh, you can think about this motivation, uh, trying to address a question, why? Why, why is this interesting? What's uh, the main punchline here? Why we're doing this? So the whole theme for this uh, three lectures will be uh, exploration of uh, new algebraic structures structures that come from uh, three manifolds and four manifolds. And um, here, by new, um, I mean two things. So th there could be known algebraic structures. Of course, uh, main theme will be uh, various uh, structures related to vertex algebras. And they will make uh, completely new, unexpected appearance from places uh, where we didn't necessarily expect them. and. Um, Sometimes the word new will actually mean really new vertex algebra. So, for instance, already in the first lecture, uh, if we uh, have enough time, or uh, maybe in the beginning of the second lecture, we'll see um, certain new uh, structures which um, are really new vertex algebras or uh, new close cousins of vertex algebras. And um, this will be. Uh, maybe even a bigger form of, of, of this word new, where um, there will be um, hundreds and millions, not just infinite dimensional families, but, but uh, re really uh, uncountably many such, such algebraic structures appearing um, um, out of the blue. And um, if I were to summarize in one word, why um, is this interesting why uh, this connection is exciting is because th this is uh, something, not, not the usual mechanism in which we usually construct vertex algebras or in which they appear. So uh, that excites many people, including myself, Boris Fagan and, and others. That's what I'll try to tell you. About. Um, also, this is, uh, because this is new, it's a more or less cutting edge development and there will be many opportunities here uh, to uh, do various research projects. So my goal is to uh, not bombard you necessarily with latest facts and this cutting edge developments, but rather uh, give an introduction so that um, you have a foundation to, to start with, um, to, to discuss this. So continuing with um, this motivation, uh, one way to, again, to, to summarize what's going on, uh, is uh, I'll give you several uh, forms of, of this motivation or big picture. So it's a connection between topology on one hand. That's where we have uh, three manifolds and four manifolds. And algebra on the other hand. So from point of view of this big picture, we'll start with um, something in topology which uh, will be a three manifold. And I'll denote three manifolds by M3. And to this, we'll associate certain algebraic structures. In fact, uh, possibly many different ones, such as um, um, for example, modular tensor category, uh, MTC, which will depend on the choice of three manifold and Sorry, perhaps Sergei? additional. Yeah. Uh, so we can't see what you're writing now. 
Uh -huh, sorry, I, oh, yeah. I'll try to keep moving the, the whiteboard. Oh, yeah, thanks. Uh, yes, thank you for reminding. I'll, I'll try to do it more regularly. So here, uh, MTC stands for uh, Modular Tensor Category, or just Tensor Category. In many cases, we'll have to relax uh, the standard notion of tensor category to allow more exotic things. Uh, some of them will come in a second. Um, but important point uh, that I'm trying to make here is that such algebraic structures will be labeled uh, or will depend on the choice of three manifold. And I'm trying to use this motivation also in part to introduce various notations. In the same vein, uh, sometimes we'll see um, logarithmic vertex algebras. So uh, I'll call them log VOA, which also will depend on choice of three manifold. And that's again the, the main point. And here uh, VOA, uh, as usual, will stand for uh, vertex operator algebra. So similarly, um, uh, topology uh, on, so this, this sort of table where on one side we have topology, on the other side we'll have algebra. Uh, there is a parallel story where instead of uh, three manifolds, one can study four manifolds. So four manifold. That could be another can, can starting you go point. Down a little bit? Uh, yes, that's right, here we are. And uh, same thing happens, so we, um, to, to a four manifold, there will be various other structures uh, that will be naturally associated. Uh, for example, vertex algebra of a different kind, not logarithmic, uh, VOA of M4 or various other things, for instance. Um, uh, I won't talk about this at all, but I just want to mention that uh, this, this exists. Um, so let me refer to the screen. Uh, sometimes my connection to the uh, notepad is lost, so I, I have to refresh it myself. Let's see if this works. Um, I hope so. So um, other possibility, for example, could be um, class in, in TMF or pi star TMF. So there are many uh, acronyms here, and uh, TMF is a theory of topological modular forms. Modular forms. Um, and and um, th this class, um, again, will depend on choice of manifold. So for instance, I can call it V of M4. So all of this um, will be some interesting, you can think of uh, the right-hand side, uh, the right column as interesting invariants of three manifolds and four manifolds, which are not numbers, but take values and fairly um, exotic from topology viewpoint uh, structures, but from algebraic point of view, of course, this is interesting and natural uh, or maybe exciting, um, such as modular tensor category, vertex algebra, and, and, and so on. And um, you can see that many of the objects that are listed on the right-hand side have to do with uh, modularity. In some cases, modular appears directly in the name, like for modular tensor category or topological modular forms. 
And uh, as a result, uh, a lot of what we're going to discuss in this lecture is will involve uh, modular forms and modular functions. So um, modularity, as of course is common in vertex algebras, will be a good way to organize our thinking. And many uh, key objects will be functions of Q. So Q is a usual parameter, uh, say e to the 2 pi i tau is in theory of modular forms. And um, one question that you can keep on the back uh, burner as we'll be discussing things is, um, what would modular property of this Q series or Q expansion tell me? So, um, of course, they'll tell us a lot about corresponding VOA structures, and um, that's why I want you to keep this question in mind. Um, right, so uh, on the, going back to um, the rest of this table, so let me also introduce this notation for four manifold. Quite naturally, we'll call it M4. And as I say, these two stories will be parallel to each other. The story about three manifolds will be a little easier just because topology of uh, three manifolds is uh, slightly easier or simpler than topology of four manifolds. Uh, but I'll try to uh, build them sort of in parallel and then we'll first discuss a three manifold story and then four manifold story will be um, close parallel. That's That will be my assumption. I reserved a little bit of uh, space in the middle of this table or kind of middle column because um, this connection, at least the way it arose or appeared, it came from physics. And in this lecture is I'll try to give you precise definitions and mathematical theorems, but um, just for uh, general uh, interest, I want to um, give you the right keywords that uh, you can at least keep in mind or share it with your friends uh, if you are a fan of physics. Um, this connection actually goes through physics. So given a three manifold, people about say 10 years ago, probably more, 15 years ago, studied so-called 3D, 3D correspondence and uh, associate to a given three manifold physical three-dimensional theory. So it's called 3D and equals two theory. Sometimes denoted T of M3. So the theory itself depends on the choice of um, three manifold, and that's a QFT, it's a quantum structure. And what I'm going to tell you about this um, objects on the right hand side are uh, basically shadows of this much richer quantum world, which mathematically, of course, is ill-defined, and uh, it sits as a middleman in this uh, transition from something which is well-defined, namely in topology, to something else that's well-defined in algebraic world. But uh, I think mathematically it would be very exciting to make this bridge uh, precise, uh, and, and that would help physicists to understand what is the mathematics of quantum field theories. This is a very ambitious goal, and that's obviously not something I'm going to attempt in these lectures, but uh, I mean, this is more like lifelong goal, and uh, I don't know if it will be solved in my lifetime, but for younger people in the audience, maybe this is good uh, to, to keep in mind. So similarly, uh, the story involving four manifolds also proceeds from physics, and there, um, natural, uh, so this, this middle uh, man or the middle object is a two-dimensional uh, theory. It's of a particular type, usually called 2D and equals zero two theory. And also sometimes denoted T of M4 to emphasize its dependence on the choice of four manifold. So in this um, uh, two-dimensional context, so two-dimensional theory is not so bad. So uh, 3D, 3D correspondence, which played a role in, in, in uh, the previous case, is of course very mysterious. And uh, there are many things that we wish to learn mathematically about such three-dimensional theories including mirror symmetry, symplectic duality, definition of Coulomb, Higgs branches, and so on. But two-dimensional physics is not so bad because um, this theory is actually conformal. 
And therefore, conformal two-dimensional field theory is actually very close to vertex hyperator algebra. So that's why, in this case, this uh, arrow from 2D CFT to VOA is much more straightforward mathematically. It's, uh, it, we can even think that these are essentially the same entities. And um, in particular, one of the things that we'll be discussing uh, associated to this two-dimensional uh, field theory is a very familiar object, mathematically familiar, uh, called elliptic genus. Elliptic genus. And um, this will be, uh, let's call it, say, chi, chi of Q. And this will be precisely the character of uh, the vertex algebra associated to this theory. So this will turn out to be a character, in fact, we'll have quite a few of them, uh, of VOA of M4 introduced uh, or mentioned above. And as a result, um, sometimes it will be more convenient or simpler to focus on functions such as the, the, these characters and learn about uh, full algebra by starting uh, with characters of, of its modules. There will be many different characters and many different modules. There is actually, uh, curiously enough, three-dimensional analog of elliptic genus. So if I go back to the three-dimensional story, uh, there is something that I can call um, 2D, 3D, analog of elliptic genus, or 3D analog of elliptic genus. And this will give us another uh, object, I'll call it that hat of Q, which will turn out to be uh, this character of log VOA associated to a three manifold um, in the same way as the elliptic genus of this two-dimensional theory is a character of uh, VOA from four. So sometimes it will be more convenient to think about um, characters uh, rather than algebras, and this is probably how I'll organize these lectures, try to start with uh, simpler uh, objects first, characters. So going back to the big picture, so what do we have here? We have connections between topology, physics, and algebra, and the way I presented it as, uh, as we start uh, with a object and topology, three manifold or four manifold, I'll have to explain what these are, how to construct general three manifolds and four manifolds. And then through some process, we suddenly get algebraic structures. So this is actually uh, quite interesting and surprising because um, usually in topology, invariants of three manifolds and four manifolds are constructed by first feeding some algebraic data. For example, quantum groups will appear in my second lecture. And um, usually one starts with certain algebraic structures, such as structure of quantum group or something related, and then constructs invariants of three manifolds and four manifolds. Here, what's exciting or what's new, that's again commenting on this word new above, is that the uh, flow of logic or flow of structure is in the opposite way. We get something unexpected, some algebraic structure uh, out of uh, topology. Uh, in fact, all these uh, algebraic structures are labeled by three manifolds and four manifolds. And therefore, even before I go through remaining four or five hours of these lectures, you can see that uh, it's definitely going to be something rich because there are lots and lots of three manifolds and lots and lots of four manifolds. In some sense, our job in this uh, four or five hours will be to explore the richness of this world. Sergey, and therefore, can yeah. I ask you a question? Yeah. So in the in the four D side, you you have something that has that associates to four uh, D manifold uh, vertex algebra associated mm -hmm. to it. 
and also the elliptic genus, you said that you have uh, the character of that vertex algebra? Uh, yes, yes. So is, is it the statement that to A4 manifold you have a vertex algebra whose character is the elliptic genus of that vertex algebra? And how correct, yes, correct. Yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly what I'll try to explain probably in the last lecture, in the third lecture. No, but, but yeah. So, so the question is, how, is, how could it be this different than just the cattle drum complex of that manifold? That, I, that does this for any n manifold? Or, or this is something about the one variable elliptic genus? So uh, let, let me try sure I understand the question. You're asking how uh, so VOA from 4 can... Mm -hmm. So the thing is that for calabi yau manifolds of any dimension, so you have these two variable elliptic genus, and you have a canonical vertex algebra that has as character that two variable elliptic genus. Mm -hmm. so, so you're saying that this is, there's something very, very special in dimension four for the one variable elliptic genus? No, 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 no. So the, the, the point is that, um, so this M4 is a general four manifold. So the theory that's, uh, that I denote here at T of M4, think about it at a, as a, roughly speaking, what we'll see is that it's roughly speaking a sigma model on some moduli space that depends on a four manifold, but uh, it may be moduli space of say instantons or something complicated on a four manifold. And elliptic genus is gonna be elliptic genus of that sigma model. So it will be elliptic genus of that oh, okay, uh, okay. actually M yeah, so M4 for us will, will be a set of labels. So it, it will be labeling different VOAs. Yeah, Does but, it make but sense? Still, still is kind of confusing to me. So, so if instead of saying elliptic genus, you, had, you said two variable elliptic genus, for example? So if, you, if your target, whatever this sigma model is, has as target uh, a calabi yau manifold, then Good. we have canonically a vertex algebra associated to that calabi yau. Whose, ver whose character is the elliptic genus of that Calabiao. Yes, that's fine, yes. And the only thing is that this uh, TFM4 sometimes is, is, may have representation as a sigma model on some moduli space, but first of all, we don't know if that's the case. Secondly, uh, probably in general it's not. For general four manifold, it, it's very roughly sigma model, but most likely it has all kinds of bad singularities and other things. So it's not necessarily sigma model. And it's also not obvious that it's a Calabi Yau. Okay, so this is something much more general. Okay. Yeah, that's much more general. So basically uh, what we'll have is, indeed, uh, I, I didn't mention this, but if you want, you can think about this uh, middle column as associated, I mean, the this, this theory T of M3 or T of M4, it's morally just some complicated moduli space of something on a three manifold or four manifold. But usually the something is extremely stacky. That's, that's uh, if you wish, a manifestation of um, underlying gauge theoretic type nature of the problem. And um, Indeed, it's a, it's a, what you suggest is a good way of thinking about it, that this VOA from 4 is basically a chiral algebra of that Calabiao, if only this theory, 2D theory, was a, was a sigma model on Calabiao. It, it's, it's a good way of thinking about it, yeah. That, does it make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, of course, uh, this is again big picture. Uh, my, my goal in some sense will be to decode many of these things or if there are some things that I won't be able to discuss, for instance, I don't really plan to talk about uh, TMF uh, here, but just want to mention this as a roadmap because everything we'll do will be somewhere in, in, this, in this big diagram. And like I say, actually, uh, from now on, I'll mention absolutely no physics. So this is <laughs> the, the only uh, mention of physics that I was planning to, to say here. So um, going back to... Yeah. Quick question. You, you made mm -hmm. this comment about like not fixing algebraic structure, like a quantum group or something like that. But there is uh, a choice of ADE type in the beginning of this story, right? It is true, yes. And I want to de-emphasize it because, um, yes, I'll, I'll make it super explicit, uh, but actually, since you ask, let me uh, also agree on conventions, 
So uh, just uh, that, that's absolutely right. So this will be a choice of either three manifold or four manifold, and um, um, but where, where shall I make this remark? So let's um, let's make it here maybe. Um, right. So remark. That's a very good question. Uh, in general, everything depends uh, also uh, choice oops, of ADE uh, root system for, for all of this. But the reason I'd emphasize that um, is that that's not the algebraic structure that, that's going to come out, of course. So this is a very boring input, in fact, that's much smaller than the choice, than, than the richness that we'll uh, get out of it. And the second reason is, uh, in, in these lectures, uh, probably uh, almost always, so for us, almost always, I'll choose A1. Or in, in, uh, if you think about it in terms of some kind of gauge theory, uh, so G will be SU2. Again, I'll say nothing about gauge theory. I'll say nothing about uh, physics. But it is true that um, you know, all of these functors, if you wish, are um, labeled also by, by initial choice of uh, AD root system. And I'll just choose A1 So th throughout this entire set. Now, um, why I'm, uh, I'm excited about this or why I'm presenting it here is because, uh, so once I'll try to explain uh, the basics of these uh, correspondences, again, these correspondences are kind of unusual. They're not the usual ways we construct vertex operator algebras in 80s and 90s. So they, they, this is quite different. And also for topology, they uh, lead to invariants of three manifolds and four manifolds, which are not quite the usual ones. They're, they're exotic or interesting. And um, that's part of this excitement. But uh, once we learn this, I'll show you also many specific questions in topology where vertex algebras or knowledge about VOAs can help us answer. So in fact, um, the, there is a two-way street. And not only we get this functor from uh, topology to, to algebraic structure, which is labeled by three manifolds or four manifolds. But understanding this uh, will help us to address some questions which are currently not addressed. And that's uh, what I will try to advertise as uh, open problems uh, in topology. So th there, are, there are very interesting, exciting questions in topology where uh, this algebraic insights could be useful. For instance, I mentioned logarithmic vertex algebras. and uh, this is cool, interesting st subject just from algebraic point of view. But I'll try to point out where addressing certain questions which are not currently known about logarithmic VOAs will actually lead to fantastic insights in low dimensional topology involving three manifolds and four manifolds. So this, this goes both ways. OK. Uh, I should probably. Um, also mentioned that this relation, uh, like I promise, I'm, I'll never come back to, to this physics, so let me get it out of the way, that uh, associating something algebraic to physical theories, so here I have, you see, physical theories in dimension two, in dimension three, um, but uh, if one can also try to associate algebraic structures to four-dimensional field theories, and uh, that's actually precisely the, the focus of lectures by Professor Arakawa. So here I'll make another comment or remark that, so let me go back to the lower part of this uh, slide. So uh, in 4D case, so this is part of the, this is subject of the lectures. by Professor Arakawa. So there the focus is uh, 4D uh, theory. And uh, there's uh, basically the, the last two columns in this table are extremely similar. So like I say, that's why uh, 2D, 4D 
and 3D stories are, are have have many parallels. Of course, many details are different and distinct. Uh, in my lectures, I'll focus mostly on on this uh, two cases of three manifolds and four manifolds, and uh, we'll talk about. Um, mathematical aspects of what physicists would call three-dimensional theory or two-dimensional theory, respectively. They actually talk to each other. So before I go to um, details, I um, want to point out that uh, there are interactions between um, these parallels of three manifolds and four manifolds. And uh, one of these parallel is uh, that um, I'll call functoriality. thinking about these arrows, these red arrows as functors. And again, we'll see more precise meaning of this later. But it will come from a basic operation in topology that we'll also explore in, in, in great detail, where you can take, for example, some four manifold and cut it in pieces. So imagine that this big thing is a four manifold. You can chop it off in two different pieces along three manifold. There will be some M3 here. And um, we already, I already told you uh, from the previous uh, part of the table that um, to this whole thing, we're supposed to associate uh, some vertex algebra that we would call VOA of M4. And therefore, a natural question is, um, how does it come about, and is it consistent with what we associate to a three-manifold? For instance, we learned that, or we didn't learn yet, but I announced that to a three-manifold we'll associate, say, for example, modular tensor category, uh, which may not be strictly MTC in a traditional sense, but some generalization of it, non-unitary or perhaps non-semi-simple, which is something you would expect from logarithmic VOA and so on, whereas to these individual pieces, we associate corresponding VOAs. Um, so some VOA and VOA prime, I'm not going to give them names, but associated to pieces of four manifolds. So a uh, natural question is, how does gluing uh, look like? Uh, and can we have interaction between these two different levels, uh, namely level of three manifolds and level of four manifolds? And of course, the answer will be yes, in affirmative that they nicely talk to each other. And in this case, uh, for instance, there will be a natural extension of VOA and VOA prime, uh, which share some of the part of their representation category uh, that will allow us to form uh, a bigger thing, VOA from four. So uh, again, I'll call it functoriality, thinking about that cutting and gluing in the world of topology is consistent with, or will be consistent with cutting and gluing in the world of um, uh, algebras or, or the structures that we're going to associate to it. Okay. So finally, uh, I'm trying to give you several different perspectives on, on this big picture or, or motivation. So um, let me give one last uh, before, before we move on and do uh, something extremely concrete. Um, so as I pointed out, um, there are uh, thinking about the structures, in particular VOAs, uh, sometimes it's easier if we just focus on uh, characters or numerical data. That's often is usually easier to define because instead of cohomology, you can uh, work um, of certain moduli spaces, for instance, you can work with numbers and uh, or a characteristic or various um, classes. And it's usually easier uh, to deal with numbers than, than uh, homological algebra. So as a result, um, I want to maybe uh, give names. So again, now we are moving more toward uh, um, introducing notations and, and um, uh, um, yeah, but various notations. I want to uh, introduce two things. So uh, now it will be a table which will consist of two columns. One will be about uh, three manifolds, um, very much like the, the previous uh, organization, but uh, now I'll make it uh, horizontal, sorry, vertical instead of horizontal. So uh, there'll be a world of, world of three manifolds. 
and uh, roll the four manifolds. So let's see. Uh, let me put it here. And by the way, in this lecture, uh, I realized that uh, I expect that uh, probably most of the participants have more algebraic background. So I'll not give definitions, for example, of a vertex algebra and will assume certain things, although uh, I'll try to be fairly consistent. But other, uh, obviously, since this um, set of lectures is connecting topology and algebra, um, I'll have to give uh, lots of definitions. And in particular, one of our goals will be to learn what generic three manifold looks like. And similarly, what a, what a generic four manifold looks like. How do we even construct it? In other words, uh, what would this uh, data of VOAs uh, be, be labeled by if, if uh, we are supposed to associate VOAs to three manifolds and four manifolds? So uh, speaking of characters, um, there will be uh, Two, uh, there'll be uh, closed parallels. So um, I'll make a kind of a table where um, first um, I'll try to specify, uh, in both cases, you see there is a log VOA associated to three manifold and VOA associated to four manifold. So in many cases, it will be easier to compute characters to learn about VOAs, especially the new ones, which we haven't seen before in completely algebraic construction, it will be easier to start with characters, and then there'll be many new insights about these characters. And characters have to be compared to uh, invariants of three manifolds and four manifolds, which depend on Q. We know that characters of VOAs depend on Q, so we'll have to have a notion of the corresponding object. And the corresponding object for three manifold will be labeled by choice of three manifold. Again, there is a choice of AD root system lurking in the background, but I'll choose that to be SU2 for most of my lectures. Everything can be generalized to uh, generic uh, AD. And uh, this, from the three manifold point of view, will be defined, and again, my job is to explain how it is defined, as um, basically as a graded character. So it will be uh, sum of minus one to the i, q to j, j and then uh, dimensions of certain spaces, H, I, J, which depend on choice of a three manifold, but will also depend on additional extra data, which I'll call B. And um, the spaces, uh, physicists sometimes call them spaces of BPS states. Again, I'm not going to say much about uh, physics, uh, but um, we'll, we'll approach the spaces in a different way. But um, that's that's basically going to be um, object or invariant uh, called that had um, associated to characters of algebras uh, for three manifolds. For four manifolds, the corresponding object is a little bit more familiar. Um, it also has origin in physics and um, also labeled by extra data. Here I'll call it V. It depends on a choice of four manifold and choice uh, and then parameter Q, which will be a formal Q variable, and can be formulated as uh, sum in an analogous way of Q to the N. But the characteristic, and, and here comes this moduli space that um, I didn't plan, uh, I'm not going to discuss in great detail, but maybe uh, in this first lecture I'll, I'll uh, mention some uh, such generalizations or, or points of view, it could be viewed as a moduli space of instantons or um, solutions to anti-self duality equations or sheaves uh, on a four manifold such that second churn class of uh, the corresponding uh, SU2 bundle or sheaf is equal to N, first churn class is equal to V, and um, it, of course, depends on the choice of four-manifold and, again, the gauge group, which I'm suppressing in, in my definitions. 
So this kind of object um, has been of interest um, for a long time, in fact, for uh, more than 25 years, and uh, is usually called Waffe Witten partition function over four manifold. So the three manifold analog is um, uh, what, what uh, we'll also consider, and it will be a little easier. In particular, the fact that um, it's a character of um, vertex algebra goes back to work of uh, Waffe and Witten, but also uh, to work of Nakajima. Who studied uh, this um, instant on counting on LE spaces uh, in uh, mid 90s and pointed out connections to uh, chiral algebras. Uh, so, in some sense, what we're going to explore is, is a generalization of this. Now, for me, it will be important that all of the uh, objects are meaningful, and um, uh, for both of them, um, for, for both of these columns, uh, there is a physical way of computing it, or physical definition, if you wish, uh, for general four manifolds, at least in principle. So I'll, I'll make this comment in, in blue, um, so that there is a physical definition. at least in principle, for arbitrary either four manifold or three manifold respectively, depending whether we are in the right column or left column. But uh, what will be important is, uh, of course, mathematical definition. So on the right-hand side, when we talk about uh, this instant on counting or shift counting or BPS counting, many of these things uh, can be interpreted in uh, slightly different ways. Um, the mathematical definition exists only for Keller uh, four manifolds. Mathematical definition um, for Keller M4. And in the world of four manifolds, these are uh, very, very special. So these are uh, quite, quite rare and um, special. That already shows that if we manage to explore this dictionary between topology and algebra, it will surely help uh, in topology. So this is a good illustration where it could help in topology to extend uh, this definition of such invariance to generic four manifolds. So, Three manifolds, as I mentioned, are simpler. So here, um, thanks to many young people and uh, recent work, so mathematical definition on the left-hand side. So I'll go back to the to, to three manifold column. Mathematical definition uh, is uh, here available uh, for almost all oops almost all three manifolds that's again due to the fact that uh, three manifolds are are simpler so that's in also part of the reason why in my lectures I'll start with three manifolds and uh, we'll learn about topology, about corresponding algebraic structures, and then proceed to four manifolds. In both cases, they're uh, labeled by extra data. So uh, this, um, even, even at the level of these characters, uh, so there is extra data, or extra labels, if you wish. which plays an important role in topology, but um, 
perhaps uh, for the start, uh, when we discuss algebraic side of the story, or if we're interested mostly in algebraic uh, structures, we may uh, sweep it under the rug. Um, but I want to be completely honest and explicit, so that's why I mention it even in this uh, introductory uh, lecture. So in the case of um, uh, waffe witten or instant on counting partition functions, this extra structure or extra label is called V. So this is element of H2 of the four manifold with coefficients, which is pi one of G. So if our um, group G is SU2, then there is nothing to worry about. If it's um, SO3, then there will be something Z2 valued. Uh, and um, again, for more general Gs, that's, that's the expression. So uh, that, that's how it looks like. Um, similarly, for um, this three-manifold cousin of this waffe witten type invariants, instant on counting, there was a label B, and uh, this label B uh, also uh, takes values in some uh, homology of a three manifold, so namely takes values in, um, well, strictly speaking, in, in uh, what should be called a spin C structure, set of spin C structures on a three manifold, but uh, it's isomorphic though, non-canonically to lower H1 of three manifold with Z coefficients. And again, um, you can think about this additional labels as labels of characters. For instance, we know that in minimal model vertex algebra or uh, latest vertex algebra that will show up later, of course, we have not a single character, but many characters and uh, or many modules. And, and then this labels V and B will be basically labeling these different types of modules. So finally, what's uh, in this uh, last table that I'm here drawing, most, most important is that uh, this objects that uh, I'm introducing will end up to be corresponding characters. So that's already um, mentioned above, so I'll put it again. So these are characters of um, log VOA associated to the three manifold in the first column and um, in the other column, it would be, these are characters of um, corresponding VOA associated to foreign manifold. So that's, uh, that's perhaps the most interesting and for, from our perspective in this lectures, between in the dictionary between topology and, and algebra will be the main, essentially the main focus. So that's, that's going to be the goal. So I'm completely done with motivation or introduction, if you wish. Now the goal will be to, in the remainder, to explain all the richness of three manifolds and four manifolds and utilize this richness to build this bridge to tell you more about this corresponding VOAs Again, in many cases, they are known. In many cases, only characters are known. And it would be great to actually construct the VOAs themselves. But conjecture is that um, for each three manifold and four manifold, you can construct the corresponding uh, invariant, uh, which is valued in, in uh, VOA. So that's, that's the exciting part. And that's exactly why this bridge between topology and algebra is, is interesting. That um, on topology side, it can help to construct new powerful invariants. On the algebra side, it can construct the whole new uh, world of corresponding vertex algebras, or in case of three manifolds, logarithmic vertex algebras. So are there any questions before I move on now to something very, very concrete? So I'm going to change gears, and uh, from this big picture bird's point of view, get down to something super concrete and explicit, and that's going to be the style of the rest of the lectures. Sorry, um, I have a very basic question, but can you explain a bit what is the H2 of M4, P1, uh, G? What does it... Oh, what yes. Does it? 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, H2, H upper 2 is cohomology. Uh, cohomology group of a four manifold with coefficients, which is a billion group, namely a fundamental group of G. Okay, thank you. Hey, thank you. So similarly, uh, yeah, H lower 1 of M3 with coefficients and Z on, on the other side is the corresponding counterpart in a three manifold case. Again, these labels uh, are usually pesky and everybody uh, hates them, uh, especially <laughs> if, if you're interested in algebraic structures, then, uh, I mean, this is more topological thing. Again, I have to be honest and say correct things. So that's why I put it there for completeness, but we can ignore them and just think that um, these are simply um, labeling different characters of a VOA, for instance, or different modules. After all, we'll need more than one module most of the time, so that's where more than one is going to come from. Okay, any, any other questions? All right, so then I have a very um, important goal in the next, um, I mean, in the, in the remainder of this lecture and, and the next one, in some sense, I need to do two things. First, I need to introduce some of this uh, invariance and get from topology to algebra as much as I can. I'll use characters as a foot in the door. Uh, but even that uh, is, is uh, important and challenging, so I'll have to spend some time defining these things. So from here on, I'll give you th definitions and theorems. And um, uh, also, uh, I'm, like I said, I'm not going to assume uh, familiar familiarity with uh, topology. So I'll try to, in these lectures, uh, basically uh, introduce you, if you wish, to some of the things in low dimensional topology, namely say what three manifolds and four manifolds look like and uh, what they're labeled by. So we'll start with something uh, simple and combinatorial, and then uh, we'll generalize that, but even the simple and combinatorial uh, aspect or, or um, point that uh, will be next uh, discussion point will be already quite rich and uh, you should think of it as uh, providing <coughs> um, some, in some sense basic version of these correspondences that, that, that outlined in the uh, introductory or motivating part. So uh, we'll start with uh, decorated graphs And by decorated graph, I'll mean uh, the following. I'll mean a set of vertices, edges, and decorations associated to edges. So vertices, edges, and function, let's call it A, for example, which will send each vertex into integers. So an example of a decorated graph could be uh, something like this. So let's say A1, A2, A3, and so on. So basically you draw a graph, it uh, may be um, with loops or, or, or complicated abstract graph for simplicity, if you wish, we can start with something which doesn't have loops. It doesn't really matter in the end. Uh, but an important point is that it's, its vertices are decorated by integers. Uh, you can think about um, graph being, say, thinking diagram of your favorite root system. But of course, the way I phrase it, there are many more decorated graphs as uh, root systems. Uh, this could be connectivity graph of uh, friends on Facebook or, or um, something else. And um, this combinatorial data will be labeling uh, basically uh, VOAs and, and these algebraic structures. In fact, it will be labeling tiny subset. So 
in the next uh, hour, which will be split between the remainder of this lecture and beginning of the next lecture, some of the experts to whom many of the definitions I'm going to give will be known or pouring, they can start thinking about what kind of VOA could be associated to, to this graph. So the claim in particular is that to, to many such graphs, there will be, in fact, all of them, there will, there will be some associated VOAs. So the question is, how do we do it? That's, uh, that's already something uh, a little bit non trivial. At the level of characters, um, in particular, we'll have to associate VOAs, but, but uh, uh, also characters of, of these VOAs uh, will be simpler objects, and that's how it came about. So um, one of these uh, squiggly red arrows, which uh, was uh, earlier in, in our discussion, uh, will, in this particular instance, will mean that uh, there will be certain character, and that's expression in terms of Q. Uh, so how do we define that? Or um, my, my job uh, in the next half an hour is to give you a definition, and it will be a multiple integral. So in this combinatorial approach from decorated graphs, we'll have multiple integrals, where number of integration variables will be the same as a uh, number of vertices in a graph. So for instance, if uh, in this case I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight vertices, it means that I'll be doing eight eightfold integral, which is, uh, of course, pre-involved. But uh, don't worry, it's, it's actually going to be quite simple and uh, not, not so scary at all uh, in, the, in the end. Before I do that, so there'll be two, two definitions. One will be the integral, but uh, before I go to the integral, let me give a definition and introduce uh, the notion of adjacency metrics uh, for, for a graph, so QIJ. I'll call the matrix Q. It will be of size, which is the number of vertices, and we'll use uh, the following rule that it's ij's entry, so i and j label the vertices. So uh, it will be, on ij's entry, it will be one if um, i and j are connected by, by the edge. And here I'm assuming that i is not equal to j. If um, they are not connected by an edge, uh, we'll just put zero in there, and if i equals to j, then um, we'll have a natural candidate, namely that label ai, the integral label uh, by which we label the vertices, so that will be diagonal value in the spot ii. Okay. So that's, that's basically adjacency matrix, and um, uh, let's assume uh, for now, I'll soon relax this assumption um, that uh, Q is negative definite. So this is just a technical assumption that will help me uh, with certain things in the beginning. Um, but if I forget to generalize it, I want to say right away that uh, this can be relaxed, but uh, in the initial formulation for me, it will be easier to assume that it's negative definite. Um, are there que any questions so far? Like I said, uh, at, at this point, I actually want, yeah. Move up to the side. Sorry? Ah, sorry, uh, the question is uh, if there can be multiple edges. Um, in principle, they can. So uh, you mean that it would be more natural to replace, for example, one by two and three and so on if there are multiple edges. Uh, they can, but um, it, it won't be necessary for reasons that, um, that that will become clear later. So th this will be good enough. What, what's important is, um, and again, that's not actually clear from the picture, the way I'm drawing it, that um, it would be good to have loops. Uh, and that's another assumption that we may or may not assume right away. It's up to us. But uh, as far as multiple edges, that's uh, 
perfectly fine, but again, um, it, it, for some reason, it, it, it won't matter if we decide to, to have multiple edges. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, as I mentioned before, uh, I, I really want now, uh, now my st uh, I want to change style in the sense that I want everything to be clear, crystal clear. So uh, uh, my, my um, big picture or introductory part uh, was, um, well, big picture. And uh, there the goal was to chart the map and uh, not explain anything. So here uh, I want to be in the rest of the lectures uh, crystal clear and um, everything hopefully is extremely well defined, well understood. So if there are any questions on, on anything, please, please feel free to ask because from uh, I could easily, um, of course, there is no way I could explain the, uh, everything in the introductory part, but, but here my goal is to be elementary, clear, understandable. So I really encourage the audience to interrupt me. If there is any, any single bit that's unclear. Okay, so now um, if there are no more questions yet, we'll move on to uh, the main object of today. So uh, I'll define the, this, this integrals. So this will be uh, the second and the main definition. So um, that will require some uh, attention. So another definition. So this uh, quadratic form was uh, just a basic thing, but uh, now we have to define this integral and it will be already denoted by the same symbol I used in the uh, previous discussion. So this will be actually making it more concrete. But here, instead of saying that this is something associated to a three manifold or four manifold, it will be actually integral associated to a graph. So like I say, we'll be slowly learning what three manifolds and four manifolds are, but uh, we'll associate um, the, this, this object to a graph. So today we kind of doing combinatorics, if you wish. And it will be principal value integral over J, where J runs in a set of vertices of the graph. For each vertex, we'll have integration variable. Let's call it xj. So this will be the integration measure. And uh, we'll be integrating for each of the variables on a unit uh, circle. So absolute value of xj is equal to 1. So this is going to be some multiple contour integral. Okay. Now, each uh, vertex and each edge will contribute to the integrand in a particular way. So everything will be modular. It's, it's like a Lego. And there will be one unit. What's good about Lego, the, the pieces are simple the basic pieces. Uh, but out of those simple pieces, you can build many complicated structures and constructions. So in this uh, simple game with graphs, we basically will have two Lego pieces, one for every vertex and one for every edge, and they'll look completely universal. So namely, if we have a vertex in the graph, so what does it look like? It's uh, something labeled by A, so um, that's what vertex looks like. It has some label A attached to it. So to this, we're going to associate um, a part of the integrand, and then we'll take product over all vertices. Uh, well, we're already taking product over all vertices, even to the extent I wrote this expression. And it will be Q to the minus a i plus two over four and corresponding variable x i minus one over x i squared. And we'll stick this in our integral. So this will be part of the integration. Then we'll do the same for each edge. So here, uh, there will be analogous 
in the grand will consist of product over all vertices and product over all edges. So we'll do the same for each edge. So edge connects, say, vertices i and j. And uh, again, let's assume that there is unique uh, just one for, for each choice of i, j, or maybe none. Uh, of course, then this will be product over all non-empty edges in the graph. And um, I'll put here a dot, 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 but uh, what I really mean is that uh, there will be a corresponding part of the integrand. And I have to tell you what, uh, actually, let me do zoom out so we can see a little more. And there will be um, corresponding part of the integrand for, for each edge. So the rule here uh, will be the following. So edge um, connects um, two vertices. Let's say they're labeled by i and j, and xi and xj are the corresponding variables. Oops. So, <coughs> i, j, then the part of the integrand uh, that will stick in is uh, 1 over xi minus 1 over xi, xj minus 1 over xj. And this goes into product over edges in this, in this formula. Okay. Finally, um, this is not all. So this is a very big integral. As you can see, it has product over vertices, product over edges, and we'll top it off um, with one last bit. We'll take our quadratic form, Q, and uh, we'll associate to it a theta function. Um, so quadratic form has the same size as number of vertices in, in this graph. So uh, it will depend on all of the x's. Uh, I'll use just this notation here. and. Um, it will have characteristics, which we can call B. Again, characteristics probably are not terribly important. Um, but uh, this, this theta, so let me give you an explicit expression for, for theta itself. Uh, it's, it is what you expect it to be. So it's a sum over lattice. So n is in q times z number of vertices plus a shift. So this um, b, naturally, uh, this, this offset, uh, the way I'm writing it here, is element on the quaternal of q. So if q has determinant 1, then uh, there is no b, and we don't even have to worry about it. If there are, uh, if can, can determinant of Q. Down little bit? Can you go down a little bit? Like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, if determinant of Q is um, not equal to 1, then we'll have as many choices of B. Uh, that's a, as, as unusual theta functions. Um, and uh, since we're kind of talking about characters, we already can start thinking about. Uh, lattice POAs associated with these lattices. Again, if, if, if you want to jump ahead, uh, and then I'll be going slowly, uh, starting with characters and so on, but that's, uh, that's of course, what we should uh, keep in mind. Um, and uh, let's see, well, right, so what's the theta function? Theta is Q to something quadratic, Q to the minus uh, N Q inverse times N, quadratic form based on Q and times uh, product over i, uh, x i to the power n i. Okay, and uh, this whole thing, that's, that's our theta function, that's, that's exactly what's uh, the third part of the integrand. So this way we, um, we, we define this, this object. 
Uh, in particular, you see that uh, it's convenient for me now to assume that determinant of Q is non-zero, so it's non-degenerate, and also negative definiteness allows us to deal uh, with uh, theta functions of uh, ordinary definite lattices rather than uh, more exotic non-definite lattices. Uh, we'll relax this later on, but in a way that will not involve lattices and will not be as simple combinatorially, but already in this case we see that there are many, many, uh, of course, negative definite graphs of this type, and uh, the point is that to each one of them we can associate this function. So um, a version of the statement that I mentioned before uh, is that for each such graph, so uh, to, to keep connection to uh, VOAs or, or characters uh, inside, so let me state this as a conjecture, that for each such graph, I don't think I'll need notation for it, but let's call it gamma, for instance, um, the corresponding um, integral um, that's labeled by a graph and that depends on Q is a character of log VOA, of logarithmic VOA. I should probably move it here a little bit. character of some log VOA, logarithmic vertex algebra. We'll talk about this later, and uh, obviously one interesting question is which one? Namely, how do we, already here we see that uh, the, the richness of, of uh, the, this world, um, and I won't be able to give you the answer for log VOA for each general graph, but um, um, I'll always be able to give you a character in, in some sense. That's that's what we define here. And uh, part of this research program or uh, exciting interaction between topology and algebra is that uh, it is believed that it should exist. And therefore constructing such uh, log VOAs associated to generic graphs, but more generally to three manifolds and four manifolds is, is precisely the program that we're trying to pursue. So I'm for now doing it in the smaller world where manifolds are replaced by graphs and how they're related. I mean, how these graphs are related to manifolds, I'll explain later. But uh, at first, I just want to limit myself to this uh, smaller kind of combinatorial world of, of graphs rather than manifolds. So, uh, well, before uh, we get to, to vertex algebras and all these generalizations, we'll need to explore this definition a little bit. So that was the main definition for, for today's lecture. So I'll start um, a theorem today, and uh, then we'll finish it up uh, tomorrow. So um, main punchline of today's lecture, aside from the big picture and all the motivating stuff, is uh, this definition above and uh, then theorem about uh, what this definition gives us. <clears throat> so, by the way, are there any questions uh, before I move uh, from definition to theorem? Uh, I guess I have a naive question about the principal value in the definition. So I, I suppose the singularity comes from the edge terms, right? Um, well, singularity comes from um, sometimes, yes. So there could be um, vertices containing multiple edges. And sometimes uh, it will happen that um, our integration contour, which is on the unit circle, will run into uh, 
uh, will will run into poles or multiple or high order poles. Yeah. So in that case, we'll have to use principal value. So, so you just delete uh, like an epsilon disk around x i equals one for each i. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, since we're doing multiple integral, actually, that's a good question. Uh, then there is a notion of Grothendieck principal value for high multiple, high dimensional multiple integrals. But um, I guess, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll mention that it exists, so it, it makes it well defined. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we, we won't need it. So um, I mean, okay. it's, it, it, it makes a, a definition well defined, but um, something that. Um, I don't know if I'll do next time. I, I was planning not, not to go through this, but um, maybe I'll, I'll suggest this as a homework since this is supposed to be schools. <laughs> uh, l l let me suggest homework. Uh, so try to think uh, about this integral. And some of the statements in the theorem that I'm going to state uh, will be easier to derive if you, if, if you, if you do this homework. Uh, namely, what, what is this integral? Uh, the, Contribution of vertices and edges are basically uh, various uh, factors which organize in some rational function of integration variables xi. So therefore, what we're doing, we're computing an integral which is basically convolution of theta function, which is nice, modular, and of course is a character of lattice VOA, that's easy, uh, with something that's a rational function. And as a result, um, this integral actually can be re-expressed. Um, I mean, you can try to take this integral by expanding the integrand in variable x, i, either near zero or infinity, and uh, trying to compute this integral by, by basically summing over poles. So specifically, uh, each dx uh, dxj over xj, what it does, it basically tries to pick out a constant term in variable xj. So therefore, convolution of this rational function with a the theta function is actually not as scary as it looks. I mean, this expression, even though I wrote it as an integral, it can be written as a sum over the corresponding lattice um, that basically tries to pick out constant term of this rational function in terms of each of the xi's, each of the integration variables. So that's that's uh, that's what's really going on here. Again, I won't uh, elaborate on it now in, in view of time because I at least want to start this theorem before before we finish the lecture. But um, I want uh, to encourage you to think uh, again as a homework or do this integral for simplest possible graph. So maybe that's a better way to say it. Uh, do it for graph which consists of a single vertex, for example, labeled by integer a. And then for general value of A, compute what this answer is. You'll find that it's extremely simple. Then, of course, once we understand how to do single vertex, do it for two vertices connected by an edge, and so on and so forth. Um, so play, play with this a little bit. Um, any, any other questions? All right, I have one. Uh, so, so you're you're assuming here this Q has a non-zero integer uh, determinant, and I presume you, you you have some finitely many b's perhaps, and uh, so you have this. If you fix the graph, you fix these labels AIs, uh, you have finitely many of these z hats. Do you have some modularity conditions for these guys? Uh, uh, for this collection. Yeah. So that. That, that's what we're going to discuss uh, in, in, in the second lecture. Like, like I already gave you in some sense uh, a sort of uh, preview or hint to what's going to happen. So this Zs, on the one hand, they will, I mean, this partition functions uh, or this integrals that we define, on the one hand, there will be some invariance of three manifolds or four manifolds that's still to come. On the other hand, as, as I mentioned in this conjecture, uh, they will turn out to be characters. So they're not going to be exactly modular or vector valued modular forms as, as an usual VOA. That's the logarithmic part here. So because we take a convolution of theta function with a rational function, they'll end up to have very funny modular properties. Actually, not too funny. I mean, they'll be of the kind that Romano John uh, has envisioned 100 years ago. So um, 
uh, now it's been, I guess, 101 since uh, he wrote his famous letter to Hardy, where he introduced some of this uh, mock uh, modular objects. And what this uh, guy is going to be, there are going to be generalizations of those. That's the reason why we'll have log VOAs rather than VOAs. But um, to me, this was a big surprise. So it, 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 as I'll try to explain again by now, mostly in the second lecture, this kind of integral came from topology. And it had nothing to do with vertex algebras or modularity. And therefore, e even if this conjecture, I mean, as we're going to verify this conjecture more and more, by now it has been checked in zillions of cases. The important question is why? Uh, w why does it happen? In other words, why does this connection between, in this case, graphs and, and uh, something that's uh, mock modular or log VOA happens? Um, Again, I don't know uh, mathematically. So, so physically, it comes from some uh, black box machinery which involves uh, analog of the four-dimensional story that, that, that Professor Arakawa is going to tell us about. But uh, of course, we want to understand this mathematically. And mathematically, I think that's that's a great question to which I don't know the answer. But it works. So I'll, I'll illustrate to you that it it it, it is true. All right, so let, let me um, state at least part. So, so theorem uh, will have many components uh, or bullet points, uh, which are different types of properties of, of, of this function. So first uh, statement will be that um, this object that, that we just introduced, um, where this label B uh, leaves in the co-kernel of the adjacency matrix Q, and it depends on the choice of graph, it depends on, on variable Q. So the first statement is that it converges in variable Q inside the unit disk. So this is fairly easy. Uh, again, if you think about my comments about convolution of rational function with a theta function, that, that uh, easily follows uh, from, from that discussion. Uh, you can think about coefficients and do the usual ratio test, uh, and, and you can quickly see that uh, that's, that's true. Another simple bullet point in this theorem, again, going through the list of properties of uh, what we just defined, is that uh, it has integer coefficients. So it has integer powers of Q and integer coefficients. So in particular, as, as we'll discuss uh, next time, um, if you compute it, um, and we'll play a bit it later, um, what you get is an expression which looks like this. It depends on B, of course, so there is overall power delta B, which may be not integer, but then uh, it has the usual form of a power series, uh, C0 plus C1 times Q plus uh, C2 Q squared and so on. So in the end, this leaves in integer power series in Q. So it has this Q to the delta in front, but the rest is nice integer power series, very much like a character should be. and uh, this delta B obviously is going to be analog of, um, if you already start thinking about connection to VOAs, this is uh, the conformal weight uh, or grading with respect to conformal vector of, of the corresponding vertex algebra. And it tells us some basic information about the structure of the modules and, and, and so on. So 
um, there will be several other bullet points in this theorem. Like I say, it, it's, we, we had uh, one basic definition or important definition today. Uh, we'll have uh, one main theorem about its properties. And uh, I'll continue next time. But um, um, before, before I do that, um, I want to share uh, one more thing with you. Uh, namely, here is um, a mathematical notebook, so I'll post it in chat, and uh, you can download it from my website, and um, I can also share the screen uh, that allows you to basically do it in practice, to, to, to play uh, with this definition. So it starts with input of the decorated graph, and as a result, uh, by, by doing this computation, it actually is not computing the integral again. It's like I say, the fact that its integral is only a mirage because uh, the disintegration essentially picks out constant terms in this convolution of rational function with a theta function. And for instance, for this fairly advanced, uh, or well, it's actually a simple graph with like, uh, I guess, H shaped uh, graph with uh, two trivalent vertices. It produces, for instance, uh, some of these uh, Q expansions. You can see that, yes, there is overall fractional power of Q. There is also, um, uh, there are integer coefficients. So some of these twos and fours uh, in denominator are uh, more like a fluke. Uh, but um, more importantly, uh, these are expressions that we will have to compare with characters of U A uh, next time. And um, I, the reason I, I show you here that this, even for this fairly simple graph, I actually don't know what VOA is. I'll give you many infinite families where uh, this problem has already been resolved and Sergei? identified Sergei? Uh, to, to VOA in, structure. But, in those yeah. series that you showed there, I've seen a few negative signs. Yes. Right. So that's, um, I'm going to explain next time. Uh, in more detail to answer very quickly, this is because uh, people usually take out in this definition that I gave you one over Q infinity uh, or one over eta function. So uh, in denominator, so uh, this uh, object that I defined should have one over eta of Q that, that I removed for simplicity or uh, if I go back to the whiteboard, so may maybe uh, I can modify That's either fine, the but, definition. But is, is it a theorem that after you take out the eta function, you get some something that is actually positive and integer, or or is it something that you've checked in a few cases? No, that's that's not a theorem. That's uh, that's part of this conjecture. So uh, if I go to this guy, then the way I defined it, uh, the it will stay. It will be stated as follows: uh, that one over q infinity will have to be added here. So that's basically the eta function. And then it's a character. Actually, um, for log VOA, because it's logarithmic, uh, positivity is not such a big deal. So in fact, um, it, it may be, if you think about uh, Felder complexes uh, and then uh, associated grading, uh, being, being this grading of, of complexes, uh, of Felder type complex and this logarithmic VOA story, uh, coefficients may allow to be negative, but um, it never happened on my watch, so uh, for every single case that I know, it turned out that once you restore this one over Q infinity, everything is positive. And that's, that's uh, again, part of this conjecture, uh, which, uh, as far as I know, has not been proven. So that, that's not going to be part of this theorem. That's a good question. And again, this is a normalization which um, people sometimes include already in the definition of this uh, Q series invariants or sometimes uh, not, and in that case, it has to be added by hand like I did here in, in this statement. If you were studying something uh, for root system other than Cartan type A1, it would be Q infinity to the power, which is the rank. So here, the fact that uh, one over, there is just one single Q infinity has to do with the fact that we're dealing with rank one invariance. But anyway, many, many of these things are still to come. I was planning indeed to address this next time uh, to make a remark about it. So since you asked, I already uh, mentioned it now, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this specifically next time as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful talk. Well,
Thank you. Uh, is there any questions or comments? Hi. Uh, one question about the labels. Uh, so the thing you call VOAM for in your introduction, its character, am I correct in understanding it would be sort of summed over the labels that you called like new or V or whatever? No, no, no. Uh, for, for each single V, um, it would be um, a separate. So from topology point of view, it would be a separate and variant of a four manifold. Uh, and uh, for for um, um, on on the OA side, it would be a separate character labeled by that V. Uh, so v, 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 v is a label of modules. Uh, what happens if we compare, for example, SU two and SO three, which are related by essentially you can take uh, SU two and quotient it by the center. So then you go from um, a joint, a simply connected form of the group to the adjoint form of the group. So um, SU2 and SO3 are closely related, and this relation does involve summing over Vs. But um, I'm not sure if that's what you're asking. But, but this question does not arise until we start comparing different uh, forms of the same uh, Cartan type. Okay, thanks. That yeah, that wasn't what I was asking. But so in particular, like the for you, the Waffa Witten partition function is something where you take the Euler characteristic of a moduli of sheaves with fixed C one. Exactly. It, I mean that's 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 what it usually is. I mean I, I don't think there is any other meaningful way of of uh, defining it. I mean sometimes uh, we we can of course form a generating function by summing over C one as well introducing additional variable but uh, and that we can we can do it but for each choice of uh, G there the definitely has to be data precisely of the form as I wrote it's h2 of, of four manifold with coefficients and pi 1 of G so for instance for for so3 um, there has to be lots of um, for K3, for instance, there will be lots of different choices of V. Yeah. Okay, thank you. W one more question. Uh, could you just comment briefly, for the three manifold, you kind of said, oh, there should be some 3D n equals 2 theory associated to you know reducing on the three manifold. Uh, so what is the log VOA like physically in terms of that uh, 3D n equals 2 theory? Uh, it's um, in, in both cases, in um, uh, again, I promise not to talk about physics, and uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if, so, so you're basically pushing me to say more about it. In both cases of uh, four manifold and three manifold, we end up with some uh, supersymmetric QFT. Uh, supersymmetric is very important here because it has a supercharge Q, which scores to zero. So you can try to consider its cohomology. So Q cohomology, or sometimes physicists call the space of BPS states or BPS algebra, then becomes the, the corresponding chiral algebra, which is what I call VOA of M4 or uh, log VOA of M3. Yeah. So it's, it's some particular algebra associated with taking particular BPS sector of that supersymmetric theory. But it's a vertex algebra, even though it's the chiral ring of a 3D field. Theory. Oh, uh, that, that's 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 a good question. And in general, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so I briefly mentioned it, that some of these notions um, 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 I'm using uh, loosely. For example, uh, when, when I write, for instance, MTC, I think I made this comment several times. It can be either non-unitary or non-semisimple. Similarly, uh, with VOA. It may sometimes be uh, not vanilla type the way uh, based on depending on which textbook we use. So uh, my collaborator Boris Fagan calls all of them VOAs. So he doesn't, for example, like to distinguish chiral algebras and uh, vertex algebras. So I'm following kind of same philosophy, and um, 
usually one has to go to fairly exotic situations to see some deviations, at least in our context of uh, log VOAs and VOAs, probably in these lectures, we won't see uh, anything beyond what, what's, what's, what, what actually is in textbooks on either VOAs or log VOAs. Okay, thanks. This is maybe just a remark to stay a little bit open-minded to, to uh, possibility that we may to relax certain notions. But so far, again, the, the, the need for this, at least in this context, uh, has been uh, minimal or non-existent. So I wouldn't worry about it. Like I say, even, even for, for simpler things, uh, much, much simpler things, where it is believed that it's just the usual vertex algebra uh, with conformal vector and normal conditions, there is a lot more work to be, to be done, as we'll discuss next time. So what you're worried about is, is much, much higher level concern about the structure of this conjecture. <laughs> Any other question from Zoom? No, I think not. What is a VOA when graph is just uh, one a vertex? Oh, that's the exercise. <laughs> yeah, that's that, that that's the exercise. That's, that's right. Okay. So let. <laughs> I'm, I'll be happy to reveal the answer, but actually, yeah, <laughs> since you pointed out, then maybe I'll reveal it tomorrow. Okay, so if there's no any more question, let's thank the speaker again. Well, thank you all, and yeah, see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Yeah, thank you.